I'm President and Chief Creative Officer of DCI. Um, I want to thank everyone for dialing in for this webinar. Our topic today is Tips from the Top, Best Practices for Working with Site Selection uh, Consultants. Um, the webinar is scheduled to go for about a maximum of 45 minutes. Uh, we'd like to take the first 20 minutes or so and have each of our three presenters share some of their top tips. And then we're going to open it up for your questions. And uh, you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, sort of towards the bottom, a question box. And I would just encourage you, if you have a question at any point during the course of the webinar, uh, type it in. That will get it in the queue. And I will make sure to, uh, to work that in and, and ask that of our, uh, of our panelists. Um, we are recording this session today, so if you have a, a colleague that you think would benefit from listening to it, uh, we will be sending you a copy of the recording uh, after, the, after the call, and you can certainly feel free to share this widely. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our three panelists. Um, they are three ex exceptional economic developers. Um, Ronnie Bryant is the President and CEO of the Charlotte Regional Partnership. Bob Marcus, Marcus is President and CEO of the Kansas City Area Development Council. And Kenny McDonald is the Chief Economic Officer of Columbus 2020. Um, these are um, three top-notch professionals who have a great deal of knowledge about working with site consultants. But that's not why we chose them speak today. The reason we chose them to speak today is because when we asked the site consultant this question, <laughs> what three re regional economic development organizations would you consider best in class? Uh, and we, we asked this of about 300 different site selection consultants. Here was the answer they gave us. And they told us 22% of those that we surveyed selected the Kansas City Area Development Council. Congratulations, Bob Marcus. You were, you were King of the hill here, man. Um, Temporarily. Directly, what's that? <laughs> Temporarily. Temporarily. Okay, that's right. There's only one way to go from here, Bob, right? Um, in, uh, in second place, in a, in a tie, was the Charlotte Regional Partnership and Columbus 2020 at 16%. This is a survey that we do every three years called Lean Strategies in Economic Development Marketing. So we chose these three uh, organizations and the CEOs of these organizations because, according to the consultants, they are best in class. So our order of march is incredibly simple. What I ask each of uh, our panelists to do today is just share with us three top tips that they would uh, uh, share with the economic development community about working with site consultants. Each of them has, has a long history of working with consultants. And I asked them to narrow it down and just share three things. So we'll go through each of those three. Uh, and the order will be Ronnie, Bob, and then Kenny. And then we will open it up to questions at the end. And I hope, you know, once again, during the course of this, if you have a relevant question, by all means, type it in. And we'll get into the queue to ask our three panelists. Uh, so Ronnie, uh, are you ready to kick us off? I am ready. All right. Uh, we'll start with your slide here, Ronnie. Now, I know. Ronnie, you're traveling and not on a computer, so well, I will, am. Uh, I, I, start. I am on the computer now. Okay, great. Okay, so with your first tip, the first one is to to offer clear and consistent uh, when you communicate and engage with with consultants. You understand the role that they are playing in representing their clients, and your responsibility is to provide the the best information that you can, which leverages your community and puts you in the best position to be competitive with the uh, project that they are representing. But the way we communicate, whether it's a written communication and sometimes in our verbal communication, it's not always clear and consistent. And and the, the more consistent we are and give you opportunity to be less confusing and also be able to, again, as I stated earlier, position yourself competitively. The second thing I want to offer is be very thorough when responding to requests for information. Uh, sometimes we are not as focused as we need be, and we, we 
provide a lot of secondary information and sometimes miss the point on what they're actually asking us for. There's a tremendous amount of information that's needed in the evaluation of a project, and it's very important that, that we listen very carefully, going back to the communication piece, truly understand what the, what the client is looking for and ensure that we provide that information in a very concise manner and be very thorough and ensure that we give them enough information and also give them exactly what they ask for. Um, my, my third tip would be to, the, the underlying goal for us is to ensure that any client that we're working with would have a pleasant, a pleasant experience working with our community and with our organization. And this is whether we win the, the project or not. One thing about a, a consultant relationship is that it's considered a long-term relationship. And you may not win a particular project, but if you, if you continue to nurture that relationship and be perceived as an organization that's responsible, professional, timely, and you, you stay in touch, there will be other opportunities for you to entertain a RFI from that particular consultant. So we want to always be positioned as giving exemplary customer service, providing the information in a manner that uh, is in format that's presentable for the, our client as well as their client, timely and professional presentation, and very thorough and concise communications. Excellent. Uh, just, just to press on your, your point number two, Ronnie, uh, one thing I hear from the consultants sometimes is that um, people just fail to answer the questions when maybe they give almost too much information. Any comments on that or any further thoughts on that? Oh, mo most definitely. I think we can, as I stated, you cannot be focused on what was really asked. The first thing you have to do I would, I would definitely recommend to our audience is that you understand the true request. And that might even mean a follow-up phone call or email to make sure that, that you truly understand what they're looking for. And then you zero in on making sure that you give all the necessary relevant background to that particular issue, whether it's labor statistics or, or salary information or real estate data, et cetera. But you definitely have to give them exactly what they ask for. And, and then they're not interested in the slick brochure of your new Riverwalk Park when uh, that's not what they're looking for, regardless of what you might think about that new park. Give them what they ask for. All right. Thank you, Ronnie. Excellent tips. We move now to Kansas City and Bob Marcus. Bob, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Andy, and I guess the first thing I would say is that I agree with absolutely everything Ronnie had to say. Um, relationships with consultants, helping them succeed uh, is a very, very important job, part of our job, and each one of the tips that Ronnie just mentioned is, is, is right on target. Um, one of the things that I would mention is that uh, uh, we, we always want to focus on helping that consultant understand our community. I think sometimes it's, it's tempting, especially when we know who our competitors are, to, to want to begin to draw some comparisons. And uh, you know, even if we use objective third-party data, um, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do because we've learned from experience that, that the consultant is the, the man or woman who is in the role of, of drawing comparisons, analyzing data, coming up with conclusions and recommendations. And we need to avoid that tendency. It, it, is, it is tempting to do so, especially when we know that we may look better here or there, but we've got to really stay focused on our community and do the best job that we can for ourselves. Um, the next tip is um, understanding that in any situation, there can be uh, there can be a problem. Maybe a building that the client was interested in has gone off the market, and they were beginning to focus on it. Maybe something has occurred within the community that has put the community in a bad light. Um, and sometimes these things are are not well known or publicly known. Well, it is far far better for us as ED professionals to be very upfront and direct 
and share not just the good news, but the, but the bad news with the consultants so that they hear it first from us. Um, it's, you know, Ronnie talked about a long-term relationship, and I think all of us would agree that we want to build that long-term relationship with a consultant on behalf of our community, but we also want to build it on our own behalf. We have an, our own personal brand that we have to uh, be honest about and protect. And uh, sharing the good things and sharing the negative things and being upfront and honest early with a consultant is the best way to develop a, an honest, trusting relationship over the long term. And then my, my last tip is, um, you know, I, I think we often, especially when we're relatively new in this business, tend to view the consultant as, as uh, almost omnipotent. You know, they're the man or the woman that understands everything that has to happen. They know how it has to happen, when it must happen, with whom. And, and a lot of that is true. But I think as we learn from experience, um, we have to be willing to say to the consultant, look, I know what you're trying to accomplish. You're after this. And you think that the best way to get it in my community is to, is to do this. But you know what? There may be a better way. Why don't you consider this approach? And it's, um, it's tempting to just blindly do what we are asked to do. But I think we're advocating, advocating our own sense of responsibility if we, if we do that, because nobody knows our community better than we do. And if we can be helpful to the consultant by taking a slightly different path than what they had projected and get them to the end that they were looking for or even a better result, uh, we should be willing to do that. Bob, I just want to probe on, on uh, the bad news issue that you mentioned there. Um, what is, tends to be the reaction of the consultant when you have a piece of bad news, like you mentioned, um, a piece of real estate coming off the market? Um, uh, you know, can you, I mean, I'm just trying to get at the value of, it, of the, the news coming from you rather than someone else. Well, in most cases, um, things that we may consider to be big issues or, you know, real negatives are, are often taken in stride and, and seen as just, just kind of a blip on the radar screen. Uh, these men and women deal with communities all over the country every single day. Every community walks with a limp. And, uh, you know, finding out earlier rather than later what the particular pain point is is a, is a good thing. So um, I think in our experience where we've had to share some bad news, it has always been uh, appreciated that they know early. And in fact, sometimes what we think of as bad news, you know, maybe a company laying off several hundred workers turns out to, to be good because it, it uh, creates some, uh, uh, some additional surplus in the workforce. Excellent. Okay. Um, just a reminder to our, uh, our audience here, uh, we're going to hear from our third consultant, uh, excuse me, our third economic developer, and then we'll open it up to questions. So if you have questions at this point, it would be a good, good point to start typing them in. So with that, we'll head to Kenny McDonald and Columbus 2020. Well, thank you, Andy, and I'll echo Bob in just saying that uh, Ronnie and Bob are um, two great people to learn from, and, and um, their tips and uh, uh, experience in dealing with uh, clients of all types, including location consultants, is something we should uh, uh, not take lightly and, and listen carefully to. Um, for uh, uh, for my three areas, uh, I wanted to start and just say that uh, you know, consultants are business people, and they're uh, either a part of a large firm uh, that they are in the middle of as a partner, or uh, perhaps uh, perhaps at a, at a fairly uh, low level on some projects. You may be dealing with a business analyst, uh, and they're inside of a, a business. Other people uh, in the consulting business may own their own firm and have direct responsibility, if you will, for a small business. And so uh, it's important to understand who you're dealing with uh, when they call you about an economic development project and perhaps what their, uh, what their ultimate goals are. And I think uh, uh, we need to treat them as much like a client as the end user uh, or the end project user as much as possible. I think understanding that is... Uh, something that's quite helpful. Um, and um, uh, you, can, you can discern their motivations and you perhaps can discern some of their, their goals and or 
uh, constraints on the project uh, if you understand what kind of business they are. If they're a one or two person shop, uh, per perhaps they have a narrow, fairly narrow responsibility. If they're part of a, a major strategy firm, uh, they may have a narrow responsibility but be offering lots of services to the client in a bunch of different uh, respects. And so it's always helpful, I think, for our team to understand uh, who the consultant is as well and what business they're in in terms of uh, how they're trying to help their client. Secondly, I think it's, uh, it's really important to, um, uh, you know, while ultimately you're trying to uh, help the end user in that project that we're all trying to get in front of, um, it's, it's, it's probably best that when a loco location advisor is working with a client that, that to the degree uh, at all possible that we're treating them absolutely 100% like the client themselves. Um, typically they know uh, much, much more about the project than we do. Um, even if we perhaps know the brand name or know the client's name, um, uh, I can tell you from direct experience that they probably know things about the project and the drivers and the strategy behind what they're trying to do that perhaps you don't. And so it's uh, uh, I, I tell our team all the time that uh, help the consultant achieve their short-term uh, goal, which is to help the client uh, uh, make an informed decision about your location and land in a good place. And that can turn out very great for your for your community. Uh, in other ways, you know, maybe you maybe you uh, have to tell them hard news or uh, can't achieve all their objectives. I think uh, serving the consultant first is uh, uh, should be part of the goal. As, as, in terms of serving their long-term goals, I think even when you're working with a project to help them understand, uh, again, help them think about long-term what they're trying to do. If they're either working in this industry or they're maybe working with other kinds of clients. There may be other clients in your community that are in the same business, making introductions to those uh, businesses within your community that perhaps could be long-term clients of theirs if they have a special expertise or something like that is very valuable. Um, finally, uh, that leads me to my third point in that relationships matter uh, a lot. And while we work very intensely with location advisors for um, very specific periods of time, either for three months or for uh, six months or uh, two years in some cases on some projects, um, I think it's really important to be building a relationship before they knock on your door. Um, and to host them in your community when you can to build a relationship and uh, help understand your community, to serve them while uh, you have a project with them in the ways that Bob and, and Ronnie were speaking of very directly. And then uh, win or lose, uh, we have to understand that location advisors are repeat customers. And uh, while any uh, company direct project is going to come and go and are going to live in our communities, we're going to see uh, location advisors, if we work in this business for a long time, uh, maybe um, dozens of times uh, over the course of a career, and to, um, uh, again, to treat that relationship with great care and to build it uh, before, during, and after, and help them, uh, help them build their business and be successful in their career, I think uh, ultimately really helps you and your community uh, be successful in your goals. Right. Um, maybe just to take one of your comments and, and put it back to Ronnie and Bob. Uh, you know, I just want to pick up on the relationships matter uh, comment that you made, Kenny. Um, can you think of an example, any one of the three of you, where a relationship really helped to make your community more competitive in a location search to give you an edge? Um, any any comments there from any of the three panelists? Well. This is Ronnie. I like to definitely um, pick up on the relationship thing. I think it's, it's it's very important for a lot of different reasons, and so I'm not surprised that all three of us uh, had some comments regarding the the, the nurturing and long term relationship. By default, we have a responsibility to try it and encourage an investment, win an investment within the uh, geographical area that we're responsible for. But I think there are times, and these my strategy is over the years is trying to develop the kind of relationship where I'm a consultant to the consultant. And what I mean by that is I want to perceive as someone that 
I want to help that individual, that location advisor, help his or her client make the best decision for that company. And sometimes the best decision might not be the Charlotte region. And so I want to be, be perceived as someone who's providing information and input, but it's not just for the purpose of pushing my community. And that, to me, helps nurture a much longer-term relationship. And relative to the competitive edge that that might provide, I'm now positioned as someone that's going to and willing to present relevant and and objective information and feedback, and therefore it puts me in a position to be able to ask some very specific questions about the project that the average my counterpart in another in one of the other competitive markets might not be able to ask because they've not developed that level of relationship with the advisor. So I think positioning yourself as a consultant to the consultant is a very strong strategy. That seems to echo a little on, uh, on Bob's earlier comments about your personal brand with a consultant. Any, any further comments from any of you on that? I think, Andy, the only thing that I would add on that topic is that while all three of us have been blessed to serve one community for a significant period of time, over the length of our career, we may, we may in fact serve several communities. And so not only do we have to know that we are representing our community, but we, we are building our own personal brand with that consultant so that when we do travel from one job to the next, we don't start over but we carry with us the hopefully the integrity and the consistency and the, the forthrightness, the speed to market, all of those things that a consultant looks for. And so we can pick up where we left off and, and, and not invest everything simply in the community, but also invest it in ourselves. OK. Um, I think uh, we're, we're right about where we want to be time-wise. We have about 20 minutes for questions here. And let me kick off. I have a question from Clark Krause. Uh, and the question for all three of you, what is something you did as part of a site visit that really helped differentiate your community? More specifically, if you had an eight-hour site visit, how would you structure that day? Any of you like to start off by answering Clark's question? Well, I've got a favorite little story, and I can tell that, and then we'll get out of the way for the, for the, for the real guys. Um, this, this goes back a ways, but we were one of, I think, probably four communities at the time competing for uh, a, a major manufacturing site from Harley-Davidson. And when the client came into the market for the first time, we had scheduled appointments throughout the day. And wherever there was a meeting, we had pre-positioned a big, beautiful, brand new Harley-Davidson in the lobby. So they were up on the 28th floor of office buildings. They were in the mayor's offices. Uh, <clears throat> They, they were in the uh, they were in a bank lobby uh, so that wherever the client went um, there was their product and it I think it sent a, a very strong message about how excited we were about the potential of, uh, of hosting that company in our community and you did win that project didn't you Bob we did yes okay great 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 story uh, Kenny or uh, or Ronnie any comments yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in just on the, uh, in, in terms of a, a day's itinerary, um, just something that, that I like to try to do, our team tries to do, is if to the degree possible, and a lot of times you're, you're really rushed for time and you're trying to fit in everything, but I find that it's, uh, it's well worth the time to take uh, uh, a half an hour or perhaps an hour, a full hour up front to make sure that you're um, you're, you're taking the time to reintroduce the community to the consultant. Even if that person has been in your community before with a different project, they look at it from a different perspective with each and every client, I suspect. And it's, it's well worth the time to, uh, to, to just kind of take a run through to make sure you ask them about their objectives for that specific visit uh, and to get them speaking about um, what they want to achieve that day as opposed to presuming 
um, that uh, you know what those things are going to be. And that is even if you've taken the time to have upfront phone calls and things like that uh, and been given that luxury, uh, if somebody's on a multi-city tour or something like that, you may be the third city or third place they're looking at on a Wednesday. And uh, it's really important to just kind of take a deep breath and say, Here, here's who we are again, really want to understand your objectives. I think that it really makes the rest of the day go well, even if you have to adjust your agenda substantially uh, with what is what, what you had planned to do. Um, I think it, uh, it's just a, in, in, it's a, it could be the most valuable hour you spend. All right, excellent, guys. Um, let me move on to a different question we have here. Within your organization, is there one person who engages with the site consultants, or do you spread this across multiple staff members? Um, I don't know, maybe we'll start with uh, Ronnie on this one. We spread it across uh, multiple. And it depends on if we have a project manager who's assigned to the project would be the primary contact, but that could also be others that might have some engagement uh, depending on on the particular information that's requested or or what's needed. So it could definitely involve more than just one person. Kenny, how do you do it in Columbus? Uh, we have multiple people who will work with location consultants. I'd say at some level all of our project managers do. Um, and uh, although I don't do it as much as I, I used to, I, I really do try to pick up the phone and at least have conversations directly with location advisors, uh, really just to pick their brain about what's going on in the economy occasionally too and to get what they're thinking above and beyond a project uh, because they're, they're out uh, – beating the bushes just like we are all the time, and they can be great advisors and coaches just uh, help you with your strategy. Um, Bob, what is your point of view on this question? Well, I, it sounds like we all take the same approach. We have four uh, leaders who work directly on uh, on these opportunities. So they work directly with the consultants, and we, we always involve our research team, and so they also are very directly involved with the consultants, but uh, we, we take a, a, a diversified approach. Okay, okay. Um, I have a two-part question from Cruz Ramos. Uh, let me ask the first one here. How do you address consultant misgivings about minimum wage issues, workforce shortfalls in terms of the skills of potential business may have to contend with in a given community? So I guess Consultant misgivings about minimum wage issues and workforce shortfalls uh, in, in skills. Um, who wants to take a stab at that one? I'll, I'll, I'll start, I, and I'm probably not clear with the minimum wage issue because that's really that's not something that we control. If now, if we're, if we're talking about salary ranges within our community, I think that's a that's a different a different subject, but I'll, I'm assuming that that maybe where that question is coming from. But uh, with, without a doubt, the the workforce quality and quantity, as well as in some cases salary ranges, is is very important part of the evaluation process. And we have to. There's not much we can do to control that, but we have to ensure that we have good information. And we, we we put our try to leverage our communities in, in a competitive light. I personally do not care to to market the Charlotte region as a cheap labor market. I'm definitely uh, we're a growing metropolitan market and and the quality of the, the workforce and it meets the, the criteria I think for for um, projects that pay their sustainable salary. So it's, it's something that we track data that we collect and data that we package and pass on, and we definitely understand the significance of it in the decision-making process. Bob or Kenny, either of you like to jump in on this, uh, the question of, of workforce shortfalls and consultant misgivings about that? Well, I think if a consultant has a misgiving uh, about the workforce, it's probably for a reason, and it probably suggests that there's a mismatch between the, the needs of the company and the capabilities of our community. And I would much rather uh, end 
uh, that relationship early, knowing that it's that there is a mismatch, than to try to push something that is just not going to work well for either side. Okay, good. Um, the second part of that question, actually totally unrelated, but but second one is, uh, could you recommend a couple of the go-to business databases that you use in terms of your prospecting work? I think we're talking well, we about. Well, we ought to have our. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say we ought to have our research directors on the on the line here. Really? But, uh, <laughs> I think you got the wrong <laughs> people on the line. <laughs> uh, you know, the, obviously the BLS data is is data that we all use. It's good third party objective data, and then there are uh, companies that will do additional work beyond that. But I, I have to be honest, I'm not close enough to it today to be able to tell you who those companies are. Okay, you're you're a big picture guy. Got it. Um, <laughs> Let me. Uh, that's, a gen that's a generous interpretation. Okay. Um, let me take you guys in a uh, in a different direction. So, each of your organizations are are large regional groups. A lot of people on the phone today come from smaller cities or counties. What advice would you have for a smaller city or county in terms of connecting and working with consultants? I think uh, I'll, I'll weigh in. This is Kenny. I I I think the uh, the consultant's view would be my interpretation is that they really want that local uh, organization to be the expert and um, to know the uh, not only the product really well, the workforce, the physical infrastructure, the sites and buildings, um, but to understand timelines uh, that it requires to get things done. Um, and to understand their community inside out and backwards. And I've seen actually some of the very best relationship between uh, consultants and and uh, uh, and, and, and leaders. Uh, I mean, they really have a lot of respect for each other because that, that's really where the rubber meets the road. Regional organizations where largely facilitators, and uh, uh, we're introducing people and putting the right people in the room. And um, it's very clear when uh, you have a community that really knows their stuff and speaks confidently and knows their product really, really well, consultants and the client uh, are confident uh, immediately sometimes. Um, and that's, that's really important. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to see uh, which ones are over-promising or just saying yes to everything. Uh, as we take clients around and stuff, and so I think uh, again, it's uh, absolutely great that uh, a local organization has a relationship directly with a consultant as well. Uh, if you do have a regional organization, it can be a path to uh, to get, getting to know those consultants if you join them on trips and things like that. But uh, um, it's a very important part of the process. And, okay. and I would add on to to what uh, what Kenny just said. If you know, if you're in a smaller rural community, but you're within 60, 70 miles of a major metropolitan area, it, it may make a lot of sense to affiliate with that larger re regional group so that you have an opportunity to see some projects that you might otherwise miss. And the regional group has some product offerings that they may not be able to offer if, if it's only the, uh, the major urban centers that are in play. OK, good, excellent comment, guys. Um, uh, this is a question for me, and I'm sort of just curious about the quantity and quality of leads that you get from the site consultants. I, I don't know if, if each of you might know the answer to this, but I'm curious what percentage of your leads come from the site consultants, and uh, are you seeing any recent changes? Is, are you seeing that expand, or are you seeing that contract, or stay about the same in, uh, in 2015? Um, uh, maybe Kenny, do you want to start off on this one? Um, I, I was I was thinking about this in the lead up to the conversation today. That uh, one thing that's changed a lot is that uh, you know, 20 years ago you used to receive uh, a formal uh, FedEx package uh, with an RFP in it, or you'd receive a, uh, a fax uh, that was a 20-page RFP or document or something like that. And today, you um, the the interactions are much more can be more can be formal, but uh, largely they might be fairly informal. You may receive a, a text message 
uh, from a consultant uh, who says, uh, you know, may have something, you know, heads up, um, you know, we may be dropping in or doing this or doing that. It's it's much more, uh, it moves much quicker, uh, and is I would say probably less formal in in many ways, which makes dealing with it and understanding the issue um, and the project uh, a little more difficult sometimes. Um, and um, it, it's just a, it's a very it's a changing environment and the mediums in which we communicate and go back and forth with consultants and projects of all kinds are uh, are changing pretty rapidly but that includes the ones that are, are led by location advisors the second thing there is there may be multiple location advisors on a single project and um, that can get certainly get confusing on our our end of the table that's why it's important to ask questions discern what their business is what their role is in the project Okay. Any uh, Ronnie or Bob? Any any comments on that? Um, my question there. Relative to the trend, I'm, we we're averaging around between probably forty-five to fifty-five percent of all of our leads come from I uh, site location advisors, and that trend has been pretty consistent. And it's the result of we we have a very focused and aggressive outreach program where we connect and, and nurture the relationship with consultants around the country. So we're we're just that's a very important part of, of our source of leads and one that we nurture very seriously. That, that's actually a really good lead into a question I just got from Victoria Vaughn. Uh, Victoria asks, what tactics do you use to proactively seek out prospective business and site consultants instead of reactive response. So Ronnie, you, you sort of started kicking off on that. Uh, it sounds like you put a lot of resources into marketing missions and going to see the consultants on their turf, that kind of thing? Very much so. We, we will schedule anywhere between 8 to 12 domestic trips a year uh, where we will go into a major market and try to visit between eight to twelve different uh, consultants in, in that particular market we actually scheduled to be in in New York in two weeks and and the purpose is for us to not only connect with consultants but we connect with media and we connect with businesses that we might be working with or might have some connection uh, to the Charlotte market but I I firmly believe that it's important that you just stop by and you you say hello, as, as Kenny referenced earlier, you have a conversation around them helping you understand what they're seeing. You can clear up any misperceptions that they might have about your community, um, provide them with current information regarding what's going on in your community. But it's uh, it's just a drop in. It's a death side bridge. It doesn't take a lot of time. Sometimes you can do something more formal and, and maybe host a dinner or a luncheon and maybe bring in um, your Secretary of Commerce or something, or your Governor, even if it's that big of a outreach. But the goal is to ensure that you go out and meet and connect and stay in touch, not just sit and wait on them to contact you. Um, just to get a different perspective, Bob, any comments on proactive outreach to consultants? Yeah, we, we do the very same things. What, what we've always tried to do, in addition to what Ronnie said, is to take advantage of uh, some of the, the professional sports assets that we have here. So if the Royals are going to be playing the Yankees in New York, we'll, we'll host a suite at the Yankee Stadium and we'll bring some guests with us. If the Royals are playing in the World Series again like they did last year, you can be sure that we'll have guests in from out of town. When the Chiefs are on Monday Night Football, we'll use that as a hosting opportunity. And then, of course, when those teams uh, are in major markets where we know we have consultants, uh, that, too, gives us an opportunity. So we always try to match up something that's fun to attend uh, with, a, with a day's worth of, uh, of business as well. And that combination seems to work well for us. All right, we have we have time, I think, really for one other question. This is another question that I I crafted, and I did give you a little bit of advance notice on this. But my question is, sometimes we learn more from our mistakes than we learn from our successes. So I'm wondering if each of you can tell us about a time in your career when you, or perhaps a member of your staff, made a mistake interacting with a consultant. 
consultant and, and hopefully what you learned from that experience. So um, who wants to start by sharing their greatest mistake? Uh, I'll start. And it, it didn't hurt us. We eventually won the project, but and I'll be very specific here. I was during the time we were in St. Louis, and we were recruiting the the Mastercard project that we landed in St. Charles County. And one of the early company visits, and we started out with a consultant, but eventually we were working very close with the company reps also. And I hosted a luncheon for the group and paid for lunch with a Visa card. <laughs> and um, that wasn't a very smart thing to do. <laughs> but we did eventually win the project. But it was very embarrassing. And they were not shy about calling me out on it either. OK, good, good story. Uh, good story, Ronnie. Um, Kenny, any, anything to share on this topic? I think, I think uh, maybe in a more general sense, and I've made plenty of mistakes. Um, probably made a couple this morning, but um, I, I think maybe earlier in my career I was I was really eager to say, yes, we can do that, and yes, I'll get back to you. I think the biggest mistake we can make is to not ask questions um, and to clarify, especially as the, if those on the line that are from states or from regional organizations who have to then translate that information to a number of people in the community or at a local level, uh, take the time to get it right and make sure we understand not only the question but the intent behind the question if they're able to tell us. Um, because, I, again, when, we've, when I've jumped to conclusions and uh, tried to move too quickly to say yes, um, it's ended up in this maybe more work on something that we had to do um, or it's been a misinterpretation of what maybe what the real issue was. And so it's, it's, it's worth taking a deep breath and, and asking a couple of uh, even dumb questions uh, to make sure that you're straight, because sometimes you'll get, a, you'll get a, a different answer than what you perceive the, uh, the initial question to be. And um, Bob, you want to wrap us up on this one? Well, <laughs> lots of mistakes, but sort of along the line of what Ronnie was talking about, we, and I don't remember the specifics, but we were talking to an airline about uh, providing some additional service into our market, and we made the mistake of flying in to see them on a different <laughs> airline. <laughs> and uh, that there was a reason for it, I, I'm sure, but uh, it was it was not a great way to begin a discussion. Okay, okay. Um, gentlemen, I, uh, I thank you very much for your time, for taking the time to think through those tips uh, and then share them with the audience here. Um, uh, in terms of the audience, we will send you a follow-up note, which will include both the, uh, the very short PowerPoint, which we presented, as well as a link to the recording of this. Um, but uh, I, uh, I really thank our three panelists for uh, uh, spending time on this and sharing their wisdom, um, and uh, hope you all have benefited from that. So, so Ronnie, Kenny, Bob, thank you so much for your help today. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. All right. Have a, have a great day, everyone, and um, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Bye-bye, guys.